Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I finally got outside for a couple of days in a row for a change and took the opportunity to measure the Antlia filter offsets. It's really a, a painful process to set up a hyperbolic curve fit procedure for the SHO filters that are now three nanometers that I have with the Antlia filter set. Those take a long time to perform enough, to collect enough light on faint stars in order to get good data for a hyperbolic curve fit. So it would really be handy to have filter offsets and just focus with the luminous filter. And I I use a little procedure that I've been using for maybe a couple of years now where I use the Batonoff mask. But anyway, I thought I'd share these results and since I'm using a Batonoff mask, it gives us a chance to talk about the quality of focus we get with the hyperbolic fit method versus the quality of focus we get with the Batonoff mask. Once it gets a little bit dark, it's not quite dark enough for imaging, uh, but it's still pretty dark. I perform a Nina autofocus run using the luminance filter. And that gives me a starting point, and then I slew over to a bright star. So at the time I'm doing step one, I'm just in a normal uh, dim star field. I'm not pointing at a bright star. And then for each filter at different focuser positions, I measure the Batonoff error using the Batonoff grabber, and I'll show you this procedure here in a minute, and get the, the focus error, which is in, in pixels and collect that data over a range of focuser positions as I move the focuser in for all of the all seven of the filters so the luminous red green blue and SHO filters and just repeat that process for all these filter positions the same range of positions I use by the way for my hyperbolic curve fit now the nice thing about the Batonoff mask is that it gives essentially a linear relationship between focuser position and focus error so then I just fit a line to each set of data and then that tells me where the line crosses the zero error uh, axis it tells me where the focus position is and then I have the focus position for each of the filters and then relative to the luminance filter I can come up with the number of steps of uh, adjustment that are necessary to achieve focus if I just focus with the luminance filter and then once I get those numbers you can enter them into the table in your autofocus filter settings from there on in you can just select the autofocus filter to be the luminous filter and then make adjustments accordingly based on the focus offset now this is just my approach there is a fully automated dark customs plugin you can install in Nina and then that will perform a series of hyperbolic curve fits and repeat for each filter and come up with the filter offsets using that method. This is just a method I choose it's independent of the hyperbolic curve fit approach. Now one of the things that I've done to set up and automate the process of collecting all of the Batonoff spike images for all of the filters and different filter positions is to set up a little imaging sequence that I, I run in Nina. So once I have the focus obtained with my first hyperbolic curve fit focus, I then move the focuser out by amount of 60 steps and then run this sequence. It clicks through seven iterations and within each iteration it takes a picture with the luminance, the red, the green, the blue, and the hydrogen, alpha, oxygen, and sulfur with the appropriate times uh, necessary to give me decent uh, Batonoff diffraction spikes. And then it moves the focuser in by 20 steps, goes back up to the top, and cycles back through all the filters again, moves the focus for position, and so on. So just like it would do if you were collecting data for a autofocus run, this does it automatically, but I'm not left with a set of data with a hyperbola in the end. I'm left with a bunch of images that have the Batonoff diffraction spikes visible. This automated procedure collects all of these images in about uh, 12 to 15 minutes, so it's pretty... Uh, pretty quick and then I can get on with my imaging now of course at the end of running this 12 minute process I don't end up with the filter offsets that's a post processing step that we'll take a look at here in a minute but I do have all of the images that I can process uh, the next morning and then come up with what my filter offsets are let's go over and take a look at a video a much sped up video of what this looks like as I'm collecting the data and then we'll go over to Pix Insight to show you what I do in the post processing step to come up with the Batonoff error numbers that I've been plotting. And we'll start the sequence running and we have the luminance filter it switches over to the red, the green, the blue at four times the speed of course and we have hydrogen alpha and you'll see this turn into you see the spikes aren't as clear once you get into the uh, SHO filters but there's enough light here to fit the lines to the Batonoff diffraction spikes here so that's okay. And so that's kind of what that looks like going through a couple of series here. And now let's go over to 
Pix Insight and look at how we process the data that we just collected. At this stage, we just have a bunch of images with diffraction spikes, and now we need to come up with the Batonoff focus error using the Batonoff Grabber software. So here's the directory from one of the nights that I did this run. You see it's just a series of images, and if I sort them in the order that I took them, you can see it goes from luminous, red, green, blue, hydrogen alpha, sulfur, and then it. this is all for one focuser position here. Then it moves the focuser, and then this is another set for a different focuser position, and so on. So we just have these uh, images here for the different focuser positions. And so if we just pick one series of data here for a couple of examples um, from say the middle of the run here drag those fits images over to Pix Insight and let's go in here you can tell what focus or position you're at by looking at the fits header if I go in here and scroll down you can see that we have the focus or position is at 18 5 21 so we need to confirm what focus or position we're at just go into the fits header and you can do that the next thing I do is to expand this out and switch over to one-to-one -one mode and then do a stretch and that brings up the Batonoff spikes for what amounts to the HA filter at this particular focus position and then I bring up the Batonoff grabber software this is that standalone software it's been around for a long time I, it's the best out there I still don't like the way Nina does its uh, Batonoff tool and I don't want, certainly don't like the way that APT does its uh, tool because the one thing I like about this uh, Batonoff grabber particularly with the SCT images is it allows me to set the capture area whereas with APT that image area is fixed unless they recently changed it. One of the things you have to be careful of when you're using the Batonoff grabber is you'll have to enter in the focal length and the diameter of your scope in terms of meters it's a little unusual so for me it's 2.31 meters focal length and 0.235 diameter meters and then the pixel uh, size for the camera that we're using now I'll just press set capture area over to the center of the star and I can see a box a bounding box you may not be able to see that but it'll do the analysis of that and you can see the three lines here it accurately captures uh, the three uh, diffraction spikes and it tells me that the focus error, which is this number up here, is 2.78 pixels. So that's the one number I have right now. And then I can do another case here where, I, once again, I'll go through, expand it, go to one-to-one -to -one mode, then do a screen stretch. And now we have the luminance filter. And I'll go back to Batonoff Grabber and do the error, calculate the error here again with these spikes and you can see that once again the three spikes are identified by the lines there and I have 1.97 pixels as the focus error and I just cycle through this going through each image file that I have so now we're at the we have the blue filter and we can again set the image area here to capture the Batonoff diffraction spikes it will do a fit once again you check the lines to make sure they're lining up with the diffraction spikes in the image and we have 2.27 pixels. I'll just record these uh, numbers down in an Excel spreadsheet and do the analysis later on. So that's the procedure. Yes, it's more hands-on. Yes, it takes a little more time than running the Dark Customs automated procedure, but it is an independent way of making an assessment. Found The first thing I, I did, as I said, uh, before running the procedure with uh, Nina and getting the Vatinov spikes that we just looked at, I first run a just a good old-fashioned Hocus Focus autofocus run. And in this case, we're at about 938. It's not totally dark yet. Uh, so there's a little background light that does affect and can affect the uh, quality of focus you get with the hyperbolic curve fit procedure. But in this case, it identifies the focus position as 18,548. It has an R-squared value of 0.93. So even though there's some scatter of some data here, it's actually looks like a pretty good curve fit for this set of data. Then I go through the process that we just looked at, collecting all the data at the different focus positions, and of course the next day when I can actually go through that process in Pix Insight to identify the focus error and then fit lines, I can then come up with what the corresponding focus error was for the luminance filter. This is taking with the luminance filter over here, and you can see there's a pretty big difference here. There's a 28 step difference which is actually quite large then after completing this process i run the autofocus again it's a little bit darker now so it's 22 it's 10 o'clock 
about uh, 30 minutes after I took the first image here. And you can see that now the Hocus Focus has come up with a focus position of 18,523, which is actually very close to what I got with the Batonoff mask. So that's actually pretty good news. And generally, I'm pretty happy with this result here, recognizing, of course, that it's still a little bit light out when I did this first focus run. And so maybe this waiting 30 minutes gave me a little better background, a little better set of stars to use for my uh, hyperbolic curve fit, and we get pretty good agreement between the two, certainly within a critical focus zone in each case. So that's good news. It's almost Groundhog Day. We have roughly the same time period, three minutes off, same temperatures outside. I get 0.93 once again for my uh, R squared value and almost identical focus position for the focuser at 18,544. And now I do the run with the Batonoff mask and I get, uh, again, very similar results to what I got the previous night at 18,525 for the luminous filter. So once again, we have a large difference here between the starting hyperbolic curve fit and where we ended up with the uh, Batonoff mask. But then I run the analysis afterwards and I get something that's a little odd. I get 18,513, a very good curve fit, 0.98, good set of data, but I'm getting a luminance filter that comes in at uh, approximately 18,513 versus the 18,525. So 10 steps here-ish, but again I'm still seeing consistently this this high number out here followed by lower numbers uh, that I'm getting with the Batonoff mask and then the follow-up uh, focus with the uh, Hocus Focus when it's about 30 minutes later. One thing again that I am seeing uh, less so here, it's a little more scattered here in the data, but essentially all of these lines are coming into the critical focus zone for the same uh, focuser position, which is good news from a focus uh, filter offset uh, perspective. And then finally on June 13th, I did something a little different. I did my initial run with Hocus Focus. Again, it's about 9.30, uh, same sort of conditions outside. In this case, I got a really good set of data and an R squared value of 0.97. And now uh, Nina is telling me that uh, I've got a luminance focuser position of 18,520. This time I use that position. So starting from that position, I stepped out the 60 steps, ran through the list, and then after doing the analysis with Nina, I come up with a Batonoff focus point of 18,511, which is still about 10 focuser steps different here. However, in this case, I didn't do another autofocus run after this. I just moved the focuser back to the focuser position identified by Nina in the first case. And I come up with this comparison. So this is what I had before I did my run. I moved the focuser through a range of focuser positions from out of focus on the high side to out of focus on the inside, and then came back to this focus position identified by Hocus Focus, and you can see that the Batonoff grabber is telling me that I'm in within the critical focus zone. I feel fairly positive about the comparison between what the Batonoff mask is telling me and what Hocus Focus is telling me. Now let's take a look at the Antlia filter offsets that I came up with. That was my original objective in doing this little study. Again, we have the uh, June 11th, 12th, and 13th. I'm not going to go through all these numbers. There's just the slope and intercept that I calculate for the lines, uh, the, the fit of the focus error, focus or position when it's at critical focus, and then the offsets relative to the luminance filter in three of these cases. And then down here we just have the offsets in terms of focus or steps uh, for an at representing an average of these three runs. And you can see the the worst error is two steps off uh, from what the luminance filter is coming up with. And now the question is, is two steps significant? If you average these slopes together, you come up with about 0.18 pixels of focus error per focus or step position. So for a two-step error here, that just translates into 0.36 pixel error, which is still within the critical focus zone. So that means that I can just zero out all of these numbers here. And so for my filter offsets, zero offsets for all of the filters. So all seven filters come to focus at about the same focus of position for the SCT, which is great news. It'll save a lot of time given how long it would take to collect bright enough stars using the three nanometer SHO filters. So I'm very pleased with this result. And so from now on, I can just do all the focusing with the luminous filter and switch 
to other filters at will without worrying about losing focus. One of the things that performing this study with the Batonoff mask gives us is the opportunity to compare the quality of focus we get from our hyperbolic curve fit method and the quality of focus we get with the Batonoff mask. But should they be the same? But with the hyperbolic curve fit method, it's taking the average focus for many low signal stars throughout the field of view. With the Batonoff focus approach, we take one star, a high signal star, and compute the focus for it. And generally speaking, the star we're using with our Batonoff focus is in the center of the field of view. Now, which of these two philosophies is better? I don't really know. One of the awesome features of the Batonoff mask is that focus error is varies linearly with focuser position, and that makes it much easier and with much higher confidence to determine focus based on that approach versus fitting a hyperbolic curve to a set of data. It's just unfortunate you can't get any sleep by using the Batonoff mask. Overall, I think the agreement between the Batonoff mask and the Hocus Focus automated focus routine actually are pretty good. It all depends on the quality of the star field that you're giving Hocus Focus. Ideally, you need numerous high quality stars with a dark background for the Hocus Focus routine to properly identify and evaluate the half flux diameter of the stars for use in the curve fit algorithm. Now I did see a lower quality initial focus with the Hocus Focus because in part I'm doing this analysis or this initial focus when it's becoming dark enough to start imaging. So I think one of the things that I might do in the future is perform the initial focus with the Batonoff mask then start the imaging sequence going. Now I do plan on repeating this process that we just saw with the SCT with my refractors. I've moved all the equipment, imaging equipment, over to the ED-102, so I'll be doing that one first, and I'll report back once I get the results of those tests. So for now, clear skies, and remember to wear your Batonoff mask. See ya.